So it is indeed the case that there is a close analogy between atomic physics and loop quantum gravity. In the case of atomic physics, the point was that if I look at the screen in front of your, your computer right now, it looks like a com completely continuous object. But if I put it under uh, electron microscope, I will see that it has an atomic structure. It is discrete structure. General relativity taught us that the geometry of space-time is a physical entity. It can act on matter and it reacts to matter. Matter has atomic structure and so therefore a natural question arises, does geometry have atomic structure? Loop quantum gravity takes this central lesson of general relativity very seriously. Namely, space-time geometry is not a background, is not a stage on which things happen, but it's a physical entity. And therefore, we look for the quantum nature, the quantum structure of this physical entity. We look for atoms of space-time itself. And that is what distinguishes loop quantum gravity from other approaches to quantum gravity, to other approaches which try to also unify general relativity with quantum mechanics. And then as you said, natural questions arise. Do we have an equation which is similar to the Schrodinger equation? And does it resolve some problems such as the stability of atom was a problem for quantum mechanics? And the answer to both these questions is yes. There are in fact quantum versions of Einstein's equations which have been written down using loop quantum gravity, using certain variables that I had introduced to describe general relativity and you use them to go to quantum mechanics, and therefore we have new equations. These equations incorporate the atomic structure of space-time in a very fundamental way. Now, when it comes to some complex objects like stars and black holes, what we do is to use a simplified version of those equations. So these fundamental equations are like the Schrodinger equations, but then we use some simplified versions of those equations, like what we do, for example, to describe molecules and so on in, in chemistry. We sort of make approximations. And so these are called effective equations. In other words, equations which capture the leading order structure, the leading order atomic structure, or the leader, or leading order quantum mechanical structure of space-time geometry. And then these equations lead to the conclusion that singularities such as at the centers of simplest black holes so-called Schwarzschild black hole, and also the singularity at the beginning of the universe predicted by general relativity, the Big Bang singularity, are naturally resolved. They are naturally absent. In other words, these instabilities of Einstein's classical equations is in fact cured by loop quantum gravity equations. In case of the quantum cosmology, in case of the Big Bang, there is much more detailed work in loop quantum gravity than there is for black holes. The reason is because in cosmology you've got many more symmetries and any time in physics there are more symmetries than the equations simplify. So in the case of loop quantum cosmology, in fact we do have the analog of the Schrodinger equation. And this equation actually has to do with the wave function of the universe and one can actually see that under the evolution, if you can start with a wave function, for example, today, when the, uh, when the universe is very homogeneous and isotropic, and you evolve it backwards towards the Big Bang, this equation does not break down. Einstein's equations of classical general relativity, they break down at the Big Bang. The loop quantum gravity Schrodinger-like equation for the wave function of the universe actually does not break down and tells you that you can evolve past the, the, what was the Big Bang singularity. Everything remains finite. The curvature of space and time remains finite. The matter density remains finite and you can go back in time. Now when it comes to questions about observational significance, these are of course the critical questions. And the early universe provides for us a very nice laboratory to test these equations. Now the knowledge about the early universe today that we have, most of it comes from cosmic microwave background properties. And most of these cosmic microwave background properties that have been discovered, latest by the Planck satellite mission, are actually in accordance with theoretical predictions. But interestingly, there are certain anomalies. There are certain small 
features which do not fit the standard inflationary scenario, for example. And so the natural question is, does something like loop quantum gravity, which goes beyond classical Einstein's theory and beyond the, the regime where we talk, which we, we begin the inflationary scenario, does loop quantum cosmology resolve these problems or these uh, small anomalies in the cosmic microwave background? And this question has been analyzed in great detail over the last five years. And indeed, a number of these anomalies have been alleviated. In other words, they are brought into the regime of plausibility. We don't have to live in an exceptional universe for the universe to have these observed features. With respect to the standard inflationary scenario, to explain one anomaly is not, it's, it's not too, too difficult. But if you have more than two anomalies, then we really live in a very exceptional universe. Whereas in loop quantum gravity, this is alleviated. The predictions of the theory and observations are in harmony with each other. And they tell us that we don't live in an exceptional universe. This is what you would expect. So this alleviation of anomalies is a good signal. Now, this also leads to some predictions. It turns out that the standard cosmological model is based on six or seven parameters. And out of them, there is one parameter which, is, which has the largest uncertainties. And technically, it is called op optical depth. And the statement is that this optical depth has changed quite a bit from the initial mission, which was COBE, through WMAP, through the Planck mission. And now what we find is that loop quantum gravity gives a 10% correction to the standard of prediction of the Big Bang cosmology based on inflation. And now there are missions which will test the optical depth completely independently. And therefore, there is a prediction. And one can see if, in fact, loop quantum cosmology agrees with it or not. We don't know what the answer is going to be. But this is very exciting because for the first time, something which is very, very fundamental quantum gravity equations is being confronted with actual observations. So to me, this gives me a great pleasure even now that we have come to the stage in which quantum gravity is not some abstract mathematical thing sitting in a high perch or high above everything else beyond the reach of technology, but is actually could be confronted by observations. Yes. So in principle, it is possible that even the elementary particles or the, the partic material particles are really excitations of geometry. This was something that was proposed, for example, from, from, by John Wheeler. And there was some excitement in loop quantum gravity that this might also arise through the application of knot theory to loop quantum gravity. But as of now, there is really no evidence for this. There is no strong detailed calculations which would actually connect the, the quantum geometry of loop quantum gravity with the fundamental particle physics. So at the moment, there is no way of unifying that we know of uh, the ideas from the quantum geometry of loop quantum gravity with particle physics. So at the moment, this program is not at all completed. This is very different from what happened with the Big Bang, with the black holes, which have to do with geometry itself. So this is a frontier in which there will be much more work that will be done over the next decade or so.